All right, so today we're going to explore the physical processes associated with snow accumulation, snow melt, and runoff. We are going to understand the fundamental properties of how we measure snow, or concepts of how we measure snow. It's kind of tricky to measure. Rain is tricky to measure, but it's a little more straightforward. Snow is actually a lot trickier. And then we'll talk about and discover current issues in snow science and water resources management. All right, guys, we love snow. This is why we're so excited. This is why we're using exclamation points. Um, snow has a lot going on and it's got a lot of different shapes and crystalline structures and forms. Um, so these are different kinds of snowflakes. And then we also have, um, you know, little pellets, grapple, hail, and all of these form based on the saturation or super saturation with respect to ice. So ice, um, so when we think of air, when you've got moisture in the air, it can actually become super saturated when the temperature goes down. And it has, and, and remember when we have um, saturated conditions, what's the number one determinant of how much water moisture the atmosphere can have, air can have in it? Temperature. Temperature. So that, that um, saturation vapor pressure is a function of temperature. And so if we have moist air and then maybe it's elevated up into the mountains where it gets super cold, all of a sudden we could have super saturated conditions, meaning we have more water in the air than is like quote unquote physically possible under normal conditions. And so that's when we can have different kinds of snow forming. And so this just shows you that um, the temperature of the air is on the X axis and the super saturation is on the Y axis. And so different conditions can lead to different kinds of snow. That's why you have drier snow, wetter snow, that sort of thing. It's depending on the kind of moisture in the air, how cold it is, and how super saturated it is. So usually we think about snow as juicy snow and fluffy snow. So there's different kinds of crystals. Um, juicy snow is great for making snowmen and snowball fights. It has a high water content. It's really hard to deal with because it's heavy, can damage tree branches, and make commutes really bad. Fluffy snow, we like it for skiing. Um, easy to make snow angels and easy to shovel, but we don't like it because, well, we can have lots of snow drifts and blowing around. It's hard to pack and it doesn't have a lot of water in it per volume, right? It's a lot less dense. Um, so snow has different densities and that density could be related to the age. You can imagine that snow's falling and slowly over time, it's just gonna kind of compact on its own weight. Maybe some more snow falls on top of it. And so if water has a density of one, you know, this is relative to water, um, freshly fallen snow has actually really low density, 0 0.07, 0 0.1, something like that. And then as um, over time, we start to get, so ice, ice we know is a little less dense, right? Not about 90% of water density. And then very dense snow gets up to maybe half of the density of water. So even if we have like a really super dense snowball, it's only going to be 50% of the density of water because of all the air that's entrapped in it. So here's a, an example of the density over time. And you can see that it slowly over, you know, days and weeks and months um, levels off to a certain kind of maximum density depending on the location. So the big question that we want to know, and this is kind of the big equation that really we care about for snow, is what's called snow water equivalent, SWE, S-W-E. And this equation says the depth of SWE, and so just think about it as inches or millimeters of water content, so depth, is related to the density of the snow, so rho S, over density of water. And so density of water, we typically treat it as a constant. Um, so the ratio of snow density to water density times the depth of the snow. All right, so we've got this big snow column and within that column, maybe the snow column is six feet deep or you had that five foot snow event that happened in 2004. How much water is actually in that snow from a depth standpoint? You could think of it as, as melting it all at once and converting it to rain or something like that. Um, so this is how you calculate that. So you need to know the density of the snow and the depth of the snow. So what, how much do you guys think, um, how much snow do you need just, 
you know, knowing that snow has different densities, snow falls, how much snow needs to fall to get one inch of precipitation? One foot, that's actually just about it, one foot. You need about a foot of snow. Like I said, that varies quite a bit depending on the snow, but um, that's, a, that's a good rule of thumb. So here's our snow distribution across the country. What do we notice here? Where's the most snow falling? Top of the Rockies, baby. And we got the Montana Rockies. Got a lot going on up here in the um, Cascade Range and the Sierra Nevadas as well. But yeah, this is where all the snow's falling. Um, now we, we can think of how much precipitation we have um, over a year and what that fraction is falling as snow. Um, so you can see in the West that up to 40% of the precipitation falls as snow um, for Salt Lake, um, New Mexico, a little bit less. Um, and kind of a function of latitude, right? The further north you go, the more falls out as snow. Obviously elevation is really important for this as we saw from that map. Um, so the more higher peaks we have, the more snow we have. So this is mean seasonal snowpack. So this is snow water equivalent in centimeters and then elevation. So it's a pretty linear relationship. Um, and these are different drainages with different kind of measurement sites. Um, so if you fit a line to it, you get for every thousand meters, you get about 65, a little bit over half a meter of, of, of precipitation. Um, this is really important because if you think about where the Grand Valley's drinking water supply comes from, it comes from the Grand Mesa. And the Grand Mesa is sitting right at, you know, we'll say somewhere around here, um, a little over 3,000 meters, 3,500 meters. It's really flat. And so you don't have a peak that kind of keeps going up to 12,000, 14,000 feet, right? And so if it gets really warm in this particular elevation range, then all that snow is really vulnerable to that warming. And so that snowpack can melt off super quick if things heat up. Um, so that potentially puts us in a bit of a, a vulnerable spot given the elevation of our snowpack. So let's talk about how we measure snow. This is a Snowtel site. Um, Snowtel is S-N-O-T-E-L, snow telemetry. Telemetry just refers to communication. And this site um, is actually the site that is up on the Mesa. There's two of them. If you've ever gone cross-country skiing at um, the first place you come up to when you drive up the hill, I can remember what it's called, or snowshoeing. Um, it's not the County Lion one, it's the one before that. It's kind of, it's called Skyway. And so you take the trail that kind of goes on, the, I guess, the northern edge of things when you're looking up into the book cliffs. You can see this site, and it's actually right off the, right off the trail or road there. It's got a lot of different equipment. We've got a rain gauge because we're tracking precipitation. We've got solar panel. We've got some winds, you know, weather station type stuff. We've got a snow depth sensor. So this is an acoustic thing that pings and, and gets you the elevation of the snowpack. And then we've got a snow pillow. And this is the most important part. So a snow pillow measures the weight of the snow on, over top and Given that weight, you're able to convert that um, to snow water equivalent. So if you've got um, the weight of the snowpack, you know the depth, you can calculate the density. And then from that, you're able to um, calculate your snow water equivalent. So these snow pillows have like a oil in them or air or something like that. And then they've got pressure transducers that tell you the weight of it over it. And you need a big area because obviously the snow kind of bridges on itself. It's got structural integrity within it. And so it can offset that weight. So if you get a big enough area, I think these are um, over three by three feet, somewhere in the middle, you're gonna get the true weight of the snow. And then as you radiate out, it's gonna be that bridged support. So it's gonna take that weight off of it. So we've got these snow tell sites across the West. They're really important. Why do we think we have this network of snow telemetry sites? What information are we getting from this? You can forecast how much water you're gonna have when it melts and goes into the rivers. Yeah, what were you gonna say, Agar? Uh, yeah. yeah, 
yeah, I mean, this is, this is the water supply for the West. This is, these are our kind of water tanks, water towers. Um, all the water that we use comes from snow melt for the, for the by and large. Um, and what we can see here are some, some kind of big trends. Here's April, 2018. 2018 was a really dry year for the Rockies uh, in Colorado, in Utah. Um, well, they, they don't have Rockies, but they have mountains. Um, and so you can see if you just compare and what we're looking at is snow water equivalent percent from 1981 to 2010. So this is kind of the standard. This is a 30 year window. It'll be updated soon from it'll be 1991 to 2020 once we finish 2020. So, uh, and that's the water year. So pretty soon we'll have a new standard that we'll compare to and they just look back at the kind of previous 30 years. So are we above that median value or below for this particular date? And you can imagine that snowpack is gonna be changing over time and accumulates over time. So how much cumulative snowfall have we had? If you look at April, 2011, we had a really big snow melt year. So in some areas it was greater than 200%. Down here we had um, 0%, 25%, 50%, much less, much less snow based on that. Um, so this is uh, the Snowtel website that will be embedded in a lecture. Let's look at the Snowtel data. This is from Mesa Lakes. That's that Snowtel site I was telling you about. It's at, at about 10,000 feet. And um, here's just a look at the water year. So a water year, I don't think I've defined that yet. Does anyone know what the water year is? Is it, do you think it's the same as January to December? What might be different about the water year? Mm -hmm. you... Exactly. And this, and this kind of snow tell thing, or this uh, graph encapsulates it perfectly because um, what you have is the water year. So it starts October 1st, we're almost there. And the idea is, is that we kind of say that's the zero mark. After October 1st, it starts snowing again. And so we kind of reset, the mountains reset. You go from, from summer to fall and winter and you get your snow. So that's why we started on October 1st. It's just kind of seasonally based. And then we start accumulating snow over time. So the blue is snow water equivalent in inches. The red is the median value from the previous 30 years for this particular gauge. Um, the black is cumulative precipitation. So this accounts for rain. And, um, and then we get the average cumulative precipitation. So you've got rain and snow. And so it builds up over time, slowly, slowly, slowly. And then at some point it starts to melt off. And so what happens here is super critical. How, what's our peak? And then how fast does it melt off? So you can see the average peak happens somewhere in um, mid April. And here the peak happened right around the same time it started melting. Then we got another dump, a late uh, May dump of snow. And this was um, 2018 and 2019. Um, and then here, what, what's, what else is different about the median versus the 2018 blue line, Val. We think about the, the timing of the runoff of the melting of the snow. So if we, if we think about zero SWE as being when all the snow is melted, what's the difference between the blue line and the red line? much later, right? So the snow hung on much later and then it melted. That's almost, you know, not quite a vertical line, but maybe that happened over a week or something like that. So at this particular site, um, everything melted off much later. If we were to look at this year, and maybe uh, I'll, I'll look at that um, soon, it, I bet you everything melted off much more quickly and maybe by um, we we're, we're earlier runoff. So here we had a later runoff and then how vertical that is is how quickly it runs off, meaning how big of a flood do we get, basically. So we've got these sites, but you can see they're, they're kind of, it looks like a lot, right, for the whole nation. But if you zoom in to Colorado, there's actually not a lot because snow varies quite a bit from elevation and topography and stuff like that. Um, so, you know, we're always wanting more snow data. Um, we can actually do airborne surveys. So this is the Tolume Basin in California. And what they did is they went and flew LIDAR, which scans the topography 
of the basin before it snowed. And then they went every so many weeks to see how much the snowpack accumulated over time. So by April 15th, they could tell you how much water was in that basin, how much would run off into this reservoir, potentially. We also have satellite data. It will not tell you how deep it is, but it will tell you if there's snow on the ground or not. And so what this is showing you is in 2019, what was the percent of time the snow, the ground was covered in snow? So here's the Grand Mesa right here, um, outside of Grand Junction. And we've got areas where we had snow cover 100% of the time in this particular window, uh, which goes from, I think, January 1st to July, um, and then areas where you don't. And you can actually correlate this percent of time that you had snow coverage to water runoff. And so this is an indirect way, but it can give you a lot more data about your snowpack. What is, what is uh, MODIS is, oh, I'm not going to be able to tell you, it's a satellite that it's just, it has a lot of different spectrums that it senses, but um, based on that visual, based on the data that it gets, the pictures that it takes, and these pixels are like 500 by 500 meters, so it's not big, it's not small, it's, but it's, it's global coverage, and that satellite, it's been up there for decades, um, that satellite then you can you can get all these different data products and so people figured out a way based on ground truthing and computer algorithms to get snow cover out of the visual data so it's a it's what we call a data product but the real tried and true method is going out there and measuring the snow yourself and i hope that we get to do this sometime um, uh, we we had a, a snow course field trip that Eric Berg planned for last March, but of course that got canceled. So um, we'll see if we can do that. It's real fun to do. Um, you get to go out and play in the snow, um, but basically you go out and measure the snow depth and the density, and you're able to calculate snow water equivalent or SWE along a transect. And the idea of a transect is you're taking multiple measurements across a valley to get a more integrated picture. So this is what a snow core looks like. They've got these calibrated ones that if you just weigh it, then um, you can, it'll tell you how much snow's in there and what the density is. Um, I've got just a PVC or a ABS pipe um, that I've made with some teeth in it that we can use too. Uh, a big part of this is digging a snow pit. So this is in 2019, we had almost two meters of snow in a lot of places or over two meters of snow in a lot of places. And so um, you dig a snow pit, you've got this rod where you measure the, the depths and increments, and you kind of see where the different snow fell, you know, with, with these lines. And then you um, insert your core and measure down at these different increments. And then ultimately you get, you know, three or four different cores of snow. Um, you measure, you know, the volume of it, and then you measure the weight of it, right? All right, how are we doing on time here? Um, so we've talked about energy budgets before when it comes to water, kind of a global energy budget. Snow has an energy bu budget that's really important. Um, when snow falls, it can either fall on the ground or it can fall on a tree, right, in the forest. And when the sun comes out, um, we could have either the snow uh, melts off the tree or melts off the ground through sublimation. Uh, wind could blow it from one place to the next. And we have um, different kinds of energy reaching the snow floor. Let's see here. So albedo is a term I'll, I'll define in a little bit more in a second, but it refers to the reflectivity of the snowpack. So even things like pine needles or dust can influence how much energy the snowpack absorbs and how quickly it melts off. So albedo is reflectivity. And so you can think of a snow covered basin versus a not snow covered basin. When you don't have snow, most energy is actually absorbed by the ground and the water there up to 70%. Um, water reflects some, some energy and the land reflects some energy. But when you have snow, you're reflecting up to 90% of that sun's energy and only absorbing 10 to 15%. Um, so this gets back to positive feedback loops. We talked about 
when um, snow melts in like the North Pole or the, the you know, northern regions, the polar regions, we have um, more ground exposed and more seawater exposed. That water absorbs more energy and then heats things up so that we get more melting glaciers, right? Um, so there's a positive feedback associated with that. Dust can really influence how much, uh, how quickly snow melts and how much we actually lose from a basin. And so we've got the, uh, this group that works in the San Juan Mountains and they are monitoring dust events. Let's see if we have a, yeah. So the dust comes from the Colorado Basin. So it comes from Utah, it comes from um, New Mexico and probably a little bit of Colorado as well. And it's related to farming. It's related to grazing. Um, it's also, there's natural, you know, without all that stuff, we would naturally have dust coming over, but it's kind of um, augmented by those, those practices. That dust is carried by wind and deposited over our mountains. So here's two examples uh, from satellite imagery where you can see a dust event that happened in 2009. And here's a similar time where we didn't have dust. And you can actually see the difference uh, just in the color there. Why do we care about dust? Well, um, they did a really great study um, looking at the response of Colorado River runoff to dust related to radiative forcing on snow. What is radiative forcing, do you think, Dylan? Um, if I had to guess, I would say the effect that dust has on absorbing energy and absorbing. Yeah, so the radiation from the sun the forcing just means where are things going? Are they going up and back into the sky or are they going into the water and the snow? All right, so radiative forcing. So they did this huge study. They had a bunch of data. They did some modeling as well. And what they found is, is that um, historically, based on lake sediment deposits, grazing and agriculture in the West that started in the 1800s um, has increased dust loading five times compared to before we had this kind of mass grazing in the West. All right, so we're getting five times as much dust. That dust contributes to faster and earlier melt, snow melt. Now, do you think that um, it matters when the snow melts? It's just gonna run down the river anyway? What do you think, Agar? A, you don't want it all melting at the same time because that could be a flood, right? B, if it melts earlier, we actually get increased evapotranspiration. The ground is exposed, plants start to grow, and you get a longer kind of growing window. And so if it melts earlier, all of a sudden we get more plants evapotranspiring, and we actually lose up to 5% of our water in the Colorado Basin, 800,000 acre feet. So that's, you know, in a really bad kind of snow year. And so what they showed is um, two different hydrographs based on modeling. Um, this is before the dust happens from like the 1800s, and this is after we got all that dust from all the agriculture and, 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 run off, um, and grazing that happened. So it's actually, a, you know, a little thing, but adds up to, it can add up to quite a bit. Like after. Yeah, so you can see that it's um, earlier and smaller peak, right? If this is the runoff from the basin, yeah. this is a bigger peak and it comes later. So the dust helps absorb energy? Yeah, so it, it gets back to albedo, right? Yeah, because the, that, the air, once it builds up on there, it's still not going to That's why they're calling them forcing it into the snow because yeah. the dust is gaining more energy than just the snow itself. Exactly, exactly. So here's the little thing here. I'll point this out. Do you see this little guy right here? What they did is um, they had a big dust event and they went and they scraped the dust off a little circle. And then they waited like a, a week or whatever. And this, this little guy without any dust on it didn't melt, but everything else around it with the dust on it melted like, you know, a foot or whatever. So that just shows you what the dust does. It absorbs the energy and results in more melting. If you go up in the snow, like in, in your hiking around, snowshoeing, whatever, look, uh, look for a pine cone in the snow uh, or, or a, a some pine needles, and you'll see that they're actually gonna be making a little hole because they absorb the energy from the sun and they're melting down into the snow. 
So even that, even like pine needles can, can make a difference. It's pretty crazy. Uh, I'll skip this, but I'll just say, you know, we had over the last decade, a really big beetle kill event that happens in almost the entire state. So beetles, they naturally live um, in pine beetles, pine bark beetles naturally live in, in these trees. Um, we had a lot less cooler winters and we had denser forest stands with a lot of trees that were the same age. And so forestry management practices, less cool winters, we had this explosion of beetles and they killed off you know, hundreds of thousands of acres of trees. So that actually can influence the snow hydrology. I won't talk about it, but given a lot of the reasons that we, we talked about today. All right, um, if anyone needs to stand up and stretch, I'm going to. We'll talk about one more kind of um, snow science thing. And then we'll kind of talk about why we care about this as engineers. So depending on how, uh, how this winter goes and everything early on, we can do a new one. All right, so another fun science thing, uh, we've talked about cloud seeding. And you guys watched a little video on it, you read a little article about it for the, um, uh, I think it's for this homework, I can't remember. But um, it's something we've been doing for decades. And the idea behind, who, who remembers the concept behind cloud seeding? Silver iodide. Yeah. Um, and Jake, I'll call on you. Do you remember what, why um, burning iodide into the air or sending it into the air helps snowfall? Yeah, because it gives the uh, water something to like uh, evaporate, sorry, uh, condense onto and create the droplets and then yeah. create snow. So it's basically a catalyst and a catalyst is a surface that allows a chemical reaction to happen. And in this case, we're, it's a crystallization that happens. So it just gives it a substrate for crystallization and the formation of snow to happen. So we've been doing it because the concept makes sense from a chemistry standpoint, from a physics standpoint. And there's been some studies that kind of indicate, yeah, we think it works, but there hasn't been any slam dunks. And even this study, so we had a, a big study that just came out, um, which was published in January of this year. And even then it's not a total slam dunk, but it's it's head and shoulders above everything else they've done. So what they what do they do differently? Well, they had an airplane see these different clouds. They had a radar set up on these mountains. This was in Idaho. And so this is a little portable radar unit like you would see for um, your weather radar. And then they had a, a big network of snow gauges that could measure snow up to the 10th of a millimeter. 10th of a millimeter. That's the kind of level they're looking at. All right, so what do they do? Um, Here's just the different, there's three, if you go across the row, you're looking at three different flights or snowstorms that they seeded. We're just gonna focus on this one. Um, so they had um, radar and they're imaging the clouds and it, it can tell you how much um, precipitation you have happening in the clouds. So they did their flights and then they watched what changed after the cloud seeding flight happened. So the plane's flying this direction, um, the storm is moving in this direction. And then we've got progression of time in these three different windows. So this is when the flight happened and then subsequently after the flight. So what they saw was more, so you see this red, that's reflectivity, that means there's more precipitation happening. And then they had their snow gauge sites and they found a 0.3 millimeter increase, so tiny of snow water equivalent. And that is um, averaged over this basin. And if you um, take the correlation between reflectivity and the SWE, so the ground data and the radar data, and then apply that over the whole basin based on these maps, they estimated that they got 275 acre feet of additional water from this one storm event. Is that a lot? Is that a little? I guess it depends on how much it costs to get that 275 acre feet, but they were that that's um, a, a quantifiable thing then. So now we know how much water we got out of this one storm event 
it's going to vary storm event to storm event, right? And some of the things that they found out is that you can't just cloud seed on a clear day, right? You need an actual snow cloud or clouds to happen. And then those cloud seeding will uh, basically kickstart that cloud into producing snow. So you have to have the right conditions, um, but it can work. All right, so we've talked about a lot about snow. Let's talk about um, how we think about snow turning into runoff. Here's that uh, picture that we might see from a snow tell site. The snow accumulates and then it melts. Well, that turns into a hydrograph. If this is a snow graph, this is a hydrograph. And so if we're, if we're measuring snow up in the basin, we've got a stream gauge at the outlet of that basin, we can compare these two things. And so you can see that here's peak snow. We're already starting to have some snow melt though. And so maybe it's still snowing, snow still accumulating, but we're getting some runoff. The peak runoff is gonna occur, basically you can think of it as the derivative of this hydrograph. Um, when you get a super steep slope on this recession limb, that's where you're gonna have that super steep runoff. And then as it melts, you're getting less and less water contributing and then the, the hydrograph recedes. So this is a snow melt hydrograph. What's happening when snow melts? Well, a lot of different things could be happening. Um, if you have the snowpack um, and it's slowly melting, you can have this unsaturated zone where there's still air in the soil and that's going down into the groundwater. And this is gonna be a very slow contribution to base flow. But as um, snow melt increases and becomes more rapid, the whole ground can become saturated and you get this layer where snow is literally running off the surface or snow melt is running off the surface and you have a lot more shallow um, lateral flow and that's where flow moves more quickly back into streams. So that's what's happening in this neck of the, neck of the snow melt hydrograph. There's another signal that we can see, and it's related to the daily temperature fluctuations. So here's the hydrograph for the Colorado River. And you can see these little up and down things that are happening. And this is on a 24 hour schedule. So when the sun comes out, it's gonna melt more snow, which goes into the river and eventually runs down to the stream gauge. So we get these little bumps and discharge at a daily basis. Those can be drowned out when the temperatures are really hot. So if we've got really warm temperatures with a lot of snow melt kind of drowns out those little diurnal signals. Same with the cooling signature. So we actually, you know, we care about snow from a hydrologic standpoint. We care about snow from a structural standpoint. And the snow load is a, is a design parameter that um, you may have encountered. Um, 75.8 inches is the maximum 24 hour snowfall in the US. It fell um, just west of Boulder, Colorado in 1921. Um, and that's, that's over 24 hour period. We had uh, 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 1100 inches of snow fall over one year at Mount Rainier. Um, so understanding how much snow is possible to fall and what the density of it is and how it contributes to load is important uh, for a building. <laughs> Did you? Nice. That's great. So here's a map. Maybe you've seen this. Um, this is a snow load map and it tells you what your um, snow load is going to be for probably a certain recurrence interval. So there's some inherent uh, probability associated with this right? Or maybe it's a maximum, something like that. Um, and so they translate the load uh, or the snow depth into an actual load in pounds per square feet. All right. So let's talk about our changing snowpack. This is something that is high on the minds of um, all water managers in the West from Colorado out to California. Um, as things warm up, we get less snow. And if you can think of um, the center of mass of the snow being, if you're, if you're to basically integrate this whole thing and understand uh, where the, the center of mass is, it's gonna be somewhere, you know, you got a lot of snow at these lower elevations and a little bit more snow up top. 
So the center of mass is gonna be somewhere in there. That center of mass is moving up as we go and it's, it's rising based on a, um, historical averages. So if we think of the Sierra Nevadas and California, this Northwest region, the historical, uh, the elevation of the snowpack center of mass on April 1st um, is at 2,100 meters. And if uh, we have another one degree center, uh, centigrade of warming, that's gonna rise up slope by 70%. Um, so we've got a lot of changing um, centers of mass and, and, and loss of basically of water being stored in our snowpack. And then we've got that positive feedback mechanism that I talked about where um, with less snowpack and more bedrock and ground um, exposed, so this is Greenland, then we get more energy um, absorbed. So soil absorbs 60% of energy from the sun, snow absorbs 10% of the energy. And the more um, surface area we have exposed, the more it warms up and the more quickly we have melting ice sheets. And in this case, when Greenland's, as Greenland melts, um, the, the, this contributes a lot to sea level rise because it's a lot of snow. All right. That is snow in a very tiny nutshell. If you wanna take a minute or two to stretch, we will um, come back and go over a little in-class activity that we'll do together. All right, so let's take a look at this in-class assignment. I'm giving you some data from snow transects. And this is actual real data from the MESA. And uh, someone went out on December 10th and they took a bunch of snow depths. They had that rod and they went down and they just pushed it through the snowpack. You're on your snowshoes walking up and you measured, okay, I got 46 uh, centimeters. And then I went back in February, March, and then May. So we've got all these depths, right? And then we can calculate the average snow depth as we walked across the valley. Why do we do tro snow transects? Well, the snow is gonna be different depths in different areas. So maybe on this north facing slope, it's gonna be deeper. And I come across the valley to the south facing slope and it's gonna be less deep. We wanna get that kind of um, variability so we can average it. And we don't want the, like, the deepest part. And the idea is to figure out how much water is available in this general area from snowpack. All right. Now, we took a, a SWE measurement at a point. So we dug the snow pit and we um, got the snow depth at our snow pit. And then we did the volume of the snow by getting our little snow core and coring all the way down. And so we got the volume. And then we weighed that core and got the weight. So now you're gonna calculate the density and then snow water equivalent using this equation right here. So that'll be a depth of snow in centimeters. Now, the last step is gonna be calculating SWE, snow water equivalent for the whole site. And that's gonna be based on this average depth. So average SWE based on the average depth. We're taking the density that we measured at a point and applying it to this whole transect average. And so what I want you to do is do the equations that you need to do in here to calculate this average SWE based on the snow transect average depth and then create a plot over time. Tell us what's happening. All right, so I'm gonna um, upload this to Canvas and you can um, download that and, and do that real quick. 